Well, good morning. Uh, I'm very happy to be here uh, to see the energy and vibrancy of this group and the work that you're doing. Uh, most of my work day to day is with industry and government. So to be here with the citizens group at the grassroots, grass tops, everywhere in between uh, is a rare opportunity and a real pleasure. And I look forward to the conversation and questions. Um, you know, when I put up my own title slide this morning and looked at that word pathways this morning, I was reminded of this beautiful quote from, the, from a Spanish poet, Antonio Machado, who said, wanderer, there is no road, the road is made by walking. And I think the spirit of this organization is very much in that. We may think about the road maps, but at the end of the day, how we get there is the reality of the work that we do. And this room and this community of actors is full of possibility to help shape that to, to make the road. So I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, possibilities for the energy transition. I think we are all aware, certainly all of us that have chosen to be in this room, of, that we live in at a momentous time. Uh, the next 10 years of our lives, whether we are 16 or 60, are lives in which the future of the planet hangs in a very delicate balance. There is a window of possibility in the next 10 years that will be foreclosed if we pass it up. Foreclosed not just for its impact on our own lifetimes, but for the lifetimes of all living beings on this planet for many, many generations to come. So I think we recognize the significance, the moral and personal and collective significance of the moment. And uh, what the analysts tell us about the challenge ahead is quite sobering. Uh, the chart on the, left, on the left side of this screen uh, characterizes the range of pathways that we might see going forward in global carbon dioxide equivalent greenhouse gas emissions uh, over the years and decades ahead. And to be on a pathway to well under 2 degrees to 1.5 degrees, the, the underlying aspirational goal of the Paris Agreement requires that we reduce those emissions on the order of 50% by 2030, 50 by 30. So that's a framework number to keep in mind. The actual commitments already made in the Paris Agreement won't get us anywhere close to that. They're a big step forward. They're a significant uh, commitment from the most important uh, community of nations around the world that has ever reached such an agreement. But we know we have to go a lot farther than that to get to the goals that we aspire to. So last year when the IPCC published its report analyzing pathways to 1.5 degrees, the news that came forth, I'm afraid, was framed as grim news. Uh, virtually every, I did a little inventory of the major headlines from papers around the world, and most of that news was presented as, it's a heavy lift, it's likely impossible or nearly impossible, and I'm here to share with you a message that's a little different than that. It's a challenging goal, but it's far from impossible given the possibilities and the realities of the work that we're doing together in communities like this around the world. So a cautionary note uh, and a, another uh, factor to keep in mind as we think about the work ahead of us is that the news about climate in the last few months has alerted us to the reality that uh, as rigorous and careful as the global community of scientists' work has been in the last 20 years of collaboration around climate science, there has been a bias in that work. And that's, that bias is deliberate. It's a bias toward consensus. So the IPCC process tries to derive the consensus estimates of what will happen to climate as greenhouse gas accumulations uh, 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 increase over time. And uh, if you haven't seen it, this little article in Scientific American just uh, uh, a matter of weeks ago by Naomi Oreskes from Harvard and Michael Oppenheimer, brilliant, wonderful scientist from Princeton, uh, based on a book that they've just published that identifies this bias and its consequence, that we're seeing more rapid changes in climate today, in climate consequence on the face of this planet 
than, climate, than the consensus community of climate scientists have predicted. So we should be aware that we are up against changes in a dynamic Earth system that may surprise us. Uh, and some of those surprises uh, may be challenging ones for all of us. Given all of that news, it's not surprising that, the, that our reactions are both uh, ones of perseverance, but also emotional ones. We know the challenges uh, that face us. And at moments, I think all of, our, all of us raise our eyes and, and uh, ask where we go next and where we can uh, summon additional personal and collective resources to the task ahead. The message I want to share with you is a story about what's happening in the energy transition. We know that, in, that the evidence in uh, recent months is that the climate transition is going possibly faster than we expected. But the good news on the energy side is that there are many signals that the energy transition is also going faster and maybe considerably faster uh, than many of us and certainly than almost all of the mainstream analysts and mainstream models of energy and climate have predicted is possible for the energy system. So I want to flag those elements of possibility and relate it to the work that, uh, that we do together to influence that scale and to influence the, the reality of the energy transition around the world. Here's a picture, uh, the black arrow here, the black line is the history of solar photovoltaic additions. It's, uh, the scale is gigawatts here globally uh, added uh, since the early, uh, since the mid 1990s. And the colorful lines on the right are a series of annual predictions from the IEA, the International Energy Agency, kind of the, the gold standard, the benchmark of international thinking about what the future would be. As you can see, every year the IEA has said, well, solar did great last year, but it's going to flatten out for the years to come. And uh, this is the result of a massive model embedded with a lot of economic assumptions that's failing to keep pace with the reality on the ground of both the economics and the consumer behavior with respect to solar. So the fact that we're missing these kind of dynamic changes in the energy system are important. They tell us, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about this, that the opportunities for fundamental change are bigger and probably lower cost than the experts running those big models have been able to tell us in recent years. So in a way, the lift looks harder than it is if we, uh, if we read the future according to what are called the integrated assessment models, those big models uh, that uh, the policymakers look at when they think about how we get to a less than two degree future. So here's the story of solar. Many of you are familiar with this, but it's still stunning to think about. In the last 40 years, the price of solar panels has declined by more than 99%, right? More than 99%. The price declines have been spectacular uh, and consistent over that period and uh, bring us to a point today that really crosses a tipping point. It fundamentally changes the landscape of energy. This is not actually a completely uncommon thing. We see what are called learning curves in uh, mass-produced products and industries around the world. And we especially see them where there's a long run, like there was for integrated circuit chips, of doubling of, 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 of uh, cumulative production again and again. So this is a learning curve. It's an exponential scale on both axes. So it's a straight line, and it describes what's happened with global manufacturing of solar panels. It's not unlike what happened in the high-tech industry with Moore's Law. This is the little chart that Gordon Moore published in 19, uh, what was it, 1965, he published this chart in a kind of obscure trade publication. It became a famous uh, Moore's Law and amazingly persisted for five decades until it's just begun to flatten out a little bit. The clock speeds of chips in the last a decade or so, or so limited by temperature. But Moore's law is not a rare exception. There are many
which we can see this phenomena of learning curves and which we can benefit by as we go through the energy transition. We're working with some colleagues at Oxford University that are trying to embed learning curves into the models that we use to look at the future of the energy system so that we, we don't make the, the mistake that the IEA has repeatedly made and think about, so what if the system is dynamic and the solutions get easier as we advance toward them? Here's those types of learning curves uh, for, for a number of, it, of the most important components, kind of, you can think of these as the keystone species of the energy transition. LED light bulbs, lithium ion batteries, solar and wind. Uh, you look at all four of those and uh, if you can't see it from the back, bear in mind the axis here is 100 for 2018, but you're looking at seven or 800 percent. So it gives you a magnitude of the price declines of all of these fundamental technologies for the energy transition uh, over the last decade. Here's the story for batteries. This is incredibly important because if you think about electric buses, uh, micro mobility, scooters, e-bikes, uh, electric vehicles of all types, uh, and the opportunity to bring low cost uh, storage onto the grid to support high shares of renewables. Batteries are a really key element of a fast transition to a low carbon future, and we're on those same types of learning curves. Our estimates are that the pack price of lithium ion batteries could be well under $100 by 2030. And uh, there's some amazing opportunities for step downs below that curve based on new technology. So let me say a little bit about what this means. And I got a slide out of order, so I'm gonna jump back and forth here a little bit. Right now, we are at a moment when in the electric utility industry, there has been a, a rush to gas, right? Gas has been seen in the last decade as the most important solution uh, for power generation, a bridge fuel, and there's about a hundred billion dollars of natural gas assets planned or in the pipeline one way or another. If you add up all the integrated resource plans, the utilities around the country, they're mostly planning to build gas plants to replace those retiring coal plants. It's about a hundred plants, a hundred billion dollars of new capacity. It's spread all over the country everywhere. So what has happened as a consequence of those curves that I just showed you, falling, steeply falling prices for wind, solar, storage, and demand response, is that it's cheaper today to build a portfolio of clean energy resources, what we call a clean energy portfolio, than it is to build that marginal natural gas plant. It's cheaper without a carbon tax at the margin today. And uh, that's a completely new phenomenon. In fact, you can see that just a few years back, it was twice as expensive to build the clean energy portfolio. Today, it's cheaper to build the, the clean energy portfolio. And the price of building and operating a natural gas plant is only going to go up going forward. So at RMI, we've done a plant by plant analysis of those 100 natural gas plants around the country to say, let's look at the economics specific to the location of that plant, to the future of natural gas plant prices, to the cost of wind and solar. What does that add up to? Well, it adds up to the result that almost every one of those plants, with a handful of exceptions, can be beaten by a clean energy portfolio if we choose to make that uh, transition. It's really a phenomenal I mean, I've been, as, as David mentioned, we worked together for many years in, at NREL. I've been working in the energy industry for decades. It's not often that you see tipping points uh, that are as consequential as the one that we're seeing here today. And I want to tell you that there are other such tipping points that we are in close proximity to and for which putting a carbon tax on the table, putting a thumb on the scale, will put us across those critical tipping points. So I want to just walk through uh, what this could mean if we take uh, the picture of the clean energy portfolios and were to put the carbon tax on top of it today. Uh, what we know is that even if these gas plants are built, we don't think they should be built, but if they are built, uh, by 2025, somewhere in the interval of 2025 to 2035, we could displace them just on their operating costs. We could replace them even after they're built, 
uh, with clean energy portfolios. So that's what the curve looks like, somewhere between 2025 and 2035, close to 100% of those new gas plants, if they were built, could still be replaced with clean energy portfolios. If we were to add a $50 a ton carbon tax, or anywhere in between, uh, onto uh, the costs of those gas plants, then we move up by a decade or more the horizon against which clean energy beats natural gas. So it's important to have that in mind. I've tried to distinguish these two facts. First, beat them before they're built. If they are built, shut them down with clean energy, and a carbon tax helps us shut them down even faster if it comes into play. So there's a lot happening in the energy space, and uh, I want to underscore that the, this kind of dynamism, this pace of change in technology, highlights for us an incredible uh, landscape of possibility, and it's not one that's lost on the, on the financial community. In fact, the reactivity of the financial community, I think we should see as a, as a source in our favor, because um, I'll just say it this way, when Wall Street looks at your industry and thinks that you're toast, <laughs> then capital exodus ensues, and that in itself is a force that drives rapid change. We're close to tipping points in a variety of industries. Look at the far right chart here. This is GE's market cap. Uh, as you'll recall, maybe in uh, 2015, they completed an acquisition to sort of stake GE's future on natural gas and gas-fired generation, right? They acquired Alstom. And then in the subsequent few years, GE lost 64% of its market value at the same time that the S&P increased by 43%. So Wall Street's ruthless. When they see that you've made a bet on an industry that's losing, uh, they won't hesitate. Uh, to vote you down. The middle chart here is the history of what happened to coal stocks in structural decline, an 86% decline in the Dow Jones Coal Index over 10 years at the same time that the Dow Jones Industrial Average went up by almost 70%. And on the left side, changes in the values of European electric utility stocks that were heavily dependent on coal, uh, 80 to 90% declines in those values for some of the biggest utilities in Europe. So again, we're at close to delicate points in the system. The big models that we crank through, that the IEA, uh, this whole fleet of, of, uh, of integrated assessment models don't really take these type of dynamics into consideration when we think about the energy, when they model the energy future. There's also a lot going on with respect to voluntary actions. That's from us at the household level all the way up to corporations. Big corporations have made major commitment, commitments to renewables procurement in the last decade and followed through on that. Look at 2018, about 6.5 gigawatts of renewable energy PPAs uh, signed by the biggest corporations in the US. That's a driving force. It's about across these, this handful of years, it's about 16 gigawatts, about 16 nuclear power plants worth of new solar purchased by those companies. So we're at a moment when uh, in the electricity sector, the renewable supplies and especially solar have gotten radically cheap and they're changing the world. We're also seeing that the possibilities to integrate high shares of renewables are expanding. Uh, this is just one of many examples that we could pick where we see these high shares of renewables are signaling that we can actually make a transition to a system that is 90 to 100% renewable pretty quickly based on existing technology, not like technology that we have to think up or imagine. A uh, good example is Ireland. Ireland uh, draws a lot of wind power uh, from the North Sea, both onshore and offshore. It's already operating for at periods at better than 65% renewables. Here was a, a, a piece of news from this week that Ireland's grid operator has announced a five-year plan, that's pretty darn fast, to be able to accommodate 95% renewables operation of its system. So I've talked a lot about electricity because that's one of the areas that's really exciting where things are happening. 
But I just want to underscore that we're, uh, that there is uh, a system of feedbacks in energy technology that's working in our favor. As we add more electrified vehicles to the grid, we have more capacity to balance variable renewables supply added into that grid. As uh, battery prices decline, markets for electric vehicles expand, and that expansion of market share leads to more R&D and faster price declines, faster marches down those, uh, down those learning curves for, for leading technologies. So trying to capture these feedbacks is hard for us to do, but it's at the heart of what we can see as a window of opportunity for making change. There's a lot of other elements of the energy transition that are promising as well. Of course, one of these is to make sure that we use less energy wherever possible, including in our buildings. Uh, the picture on the upper left here is RMI's uh, headquarters office building in, in Basalt, Colorado, a pretty challenging climate, both on the cold and hot side at, at times of the year, that is a net positive building, uh, heated with essentially the equivalent of a, of a hair dryer's worth of energy uh, by virtue of a climate that allows a lot of solar gain in the winter and a super insulated building. So it's amazing what we can do with integrated design of buildings and of communities. We've worked in uh, India with a community called Palava that's a uh, million person scale uh, city near Mumbai planned as a net zero community. So there's tremendous opportunities on the horizon for net zero construction at the level of individual buildings and residences all the way up to the level of communities. There's also an opportunity for us in radically improving the transparency of energy and climate data. It's kind of a shocking thing that for the most important challenge to humanity and to the planet, we wait kind of on the order of two years to get a report from a government that says, well, we think we emitted X tons of carbon dioxide and methane two years ago or three years ago. The lag and the lack of quality in this information is literally astonishing. It's breathtaking. We shouldn't stand for it. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we have the capacity with an integrated uh, capability of satellite monitoring and ground-based big data to understand with incredible ac accuracy the emissions from every power plant and major industrial site in the world if we were to apply the resources to gather that data and bring it much, much closer to real time. What that means, I think, and uh, this is closely aligned with the, with the types of steps that a carbon tax will bring us toward is that in the future we should be able to see just like we see product labeling food product labeling uh, on on the products we buy we should know the carbon footprint of everything that we're buying not just in terms of the flow of energy like an energy rating on a refrigerator but the embodied energy that's in it so there's incredible opportunity for us to leap forward in bringing that data closer to real time in energy markets uh, blockchain and other tools are giving us a better ability to have decentralized and digitalized systems that can bring this kind of information about carbon or emissions attributes of the energy system into our view and into the operations of those systems. So when we step back and think about it, uh, I highlighted earlier that IPCC report, Pathways to 1.5 Degrees. What the IPCC showed us was that, in their view, there's a couple of different ways to get there. From left to right, a spectrum here of low demand to high demand pathways to 1.5 degrees. The high demand pathways require that big yellow band of carbon capture and sequestration to keep us below 1.5 degrees. And, uh, those are technologies that we don't know a lot about yet and that would require essentially that we commit future generations uh, to be capturing that carbon because we emitted a lot in the next couple of decades. The trade-off is between 
energy demand today and higher carbon capture in the future, uh, the more energy we use today. So the differences across that spectrum are quite significant. The energy companies, and this is a, as you may, many of you may have seen, a, a big ad push by, uh, by Exxon in the last six months. The energy companies are assuring us that, don't worry, we can vacuum carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Uh, and it's, gee, it's a cheerful picture. It's, just, it's, it's, it's as easy as catching balloons, I guess. But, but honestly, uh, from our perspective, uh, it's a way cheaper solution and a way simpler solution for us to act now to reduce emissions, to make the adjustments that can actually be reinforced by some of the dynamics of, of, uh, of the marketplace to act faster. So I want to round off with, uh, I've talked mostly about the energy system and I think this room and this, the work of this community is about something that stands at least as importantly and maybe more importantly in parallel to that, which is the people system. Uh, Peter Senge and his colleagues wrote a really beautiful article a couple of years back about what they called system leadership, which is not the leadership of command and control, but it's the leadership of understanding that we work together in a community and that our roles are complementary and that our effectiveness comes from that complementarity. Um, Paul Schmitz did a beautiful talk about uh, Rosa Parks in the spirit of systems leadership. And he, in that talk, turns the clock uh, around the role of Rosa Parks in the civil rights movement. We all know Rosa Parks' name. And when he unveiled the Rosa Parks statue, uh, uh, President Obama said, I stand here because of the work done by Rosa Parks and her colleagues. But Rosa Parks was a systems leader and part of a community that involved about 20 actors that helped her to be prepared to do what she did, that followed up her action to lead to a community-wide bus strike that took incredible perseverance and energy and commitment by a whole community of people. So it's not like there are magic individuals that make these things happen for us. These kind of changes in the world happen by the actions of all of us, understanding that we're a system and a community. So I'll round off with a quote from, in, this, uh, in the spirit of system leadership from, uh, from Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, this was in 1945. Gandhi was in prison. I visited the, the room where he was in prison for more than two years in India last year uh, and was really touched by, uh, by what I saw there. And um, when I went to a little library for Gandhi, this site, it's the Aga Khan Palace in, uh, in uh, Pune. Uh, there was a little handwritten, like uh, in a, in a schoolchild's ha hand script in both Hindi and English, there was a quote from Gandhi on the wall. And it said this, which, which impressed me, uh, and I, I offer it to you for all of our encouragement as we do work that requires that we be steadfast and persistent in the way that we tackle these problems. He said, there is a vast difference between obstinacy and steadfastness. To seek to foist one's view on others is obstinacy, whereas steadfastness is that whereby we voluntarily impose something on ourselves and which results in bringing others around to the acceptance of our view by their own free will. So I think we start with solutions to the carbon challenge, to the climate challenge, by imposing the standard on ourselves. And I mean not just ourselves individually, but ourselves as a community, working together at all levels. And that's the basis. That's certainly the spirit of the, of the work that I see you doing and the spirit of the opportunity for dramatic changes ahead. Thank you. Thanks a million, Jim. We do have um, a fairly good amount of time for questions and answers. And the way we're going to do that is um, we will have a microphone come to you. Would the folks with the microphones please uh, identify themselves, wave your hands so you know.
to flag them down and get a microphone and okay, we can start with Andrew back there for one. Okay. See if you can make that one work. Okay. Put it up higher. This one? Yeah. That should be a little bit. Better. How's that? I can't really hear. Okay. Can really hear Jim? Yeah. Does that work? Can you hear me back there? Yeah. All right. I'll just try to speak up. Do. Thank you so Please. much for the presentation, for starters. I had the, a member of my chapter ask me about the resources involved in creating wind energy and, and solar energy. So both drawing from the systems uh, that, and then of course the, the disposal of those uh, elements of solar panels, etc. Can you speak to how those will or are addressed at this point? Yeah, for sure. It's, it's a great question. I'm not a deep technical expert on this, but I can for sure tell you the, the landscape. So the first thing to say is it's better for the environment all around for us to use energy more efficiently than to provide it by renewables, right, or, or any source. So the best option is efficiency uh, with respect to materials cycles, uh, waste disposal, all of those issues in addition to the energy cycle. That said, uh, there are important questions raised and they should be raised about the environmental consequence of, of the uh, materials and the embodied energy in wind and solar. It's still hands down better <laughs> by far uh, and there's really no uh, serious debate or question around that. that uh, I mean, you may hear people blow smoke about it, but there's no question that the net benefit of wind and solar from an energy perspective is quite compelling compared to the alternatives. But there are really important issues and one of these that we're working on closely has to do with the light, materials life cycle of lithium ion batteries, which we are not doing a good job today of, of effectively recycling and there are important challenges and questions about that. If we look at the ramp rate for producing those batteries and producing electric vehicles, it's great, you know, that's good news for the climate but it's also challenging news from a, a toxic materials disposal perspective. So we need to push harder on uh, ensuring closed loop uh, circular economy uh, approaches to those materials and uh, it's really, really important. We have a, we've been working uh, in India in the last couple of years really closely on mobility solutions, on you know, the next generation of uh, urban mobility solutions for a country like India. This is um, an, an incredible opportunity and challenge because this number stuns me every time I try to get my head around it. There, if we look at urban populations around the world, right, in, 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 in mature economies like ours, the change between now and 2050 is we'll add about 150 million people in the, in the developed economies to cities. In the emerging economies between now and 2050, we'll add 2.1 billion people to cities, right? So breathtaking, 2.1 billion additional people in cities. Uh, so when we think about mobility solutions for, for cities, we, what we really need is a learning curve like that for how to build cities. Better uh, integrated multimodal transportation we can't, the solution is not replace cars with electric cars. <laughs> it cannot be the solution. It's, it's impractical and, and, and there's no you know, realistic uh, scenario where that can work. So the opportunity is for leapfrog solutions that mean less personally owned vehicles, more uh, 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 public transportation, more two and three wheelers like they already have in those cities. Uh, and so these kind of solutions that integrate lower resource use of all kinds really have to be at the forefront if we're going to get the, the, you know, not just, not just balance the climate, but balance the planet's uh, materials resources. 
Yeah, well, maybe just if there's a microphone, we can. OK, yeah, fine, sorry. Morning, um, a really good presentation. You just, um, I'm in the energy industry as well. You know, get renewable portfolio standards in different states, like 100% by 2050. I'm just wondering you know, if it's a fairly really clear pathway, but will that really get us to these reductions that we need? You know, what percentage would that give us? Or you know, how much of a gap we still have to get to? To, um, to completely decarbonize the way we're getting to, because I think I'm just trying to show the scale of the different industries that need to decarbonize. Yeah. No, it's definitely, it, it's a step, and it's a helpful step, the renewable portfolio standards, where, uh, you know, certainly California has been a leader in this regard, and New York. Uh, we've been involved with some other uh, NGOs in organizing what's called America's Pledge, which is to look at, since our federal government has stepped back from commitment on climate, to look at the aggregation of the commitments being made by cities and states and roll those up and step those forward and say, you know what, we're still in at, at this level. We're still in and committed to the, you know, to the Paris objectives. So they're significant uh, with respect to the, the, you know, the complementarity between doing that where it can be done and doing a, an across-the-board carbon tax, there's no question that if we're able to achieve a carbon tax, that's a more systematic incentive for industry uh, across the board to act. So I think they're, they're both really important. We've been really encouraged by what we're seeing from city governments uh, in the last two years because cities, not just in this country, but around the world are stepping up and they're real locus for for really effective action because they can you know, they can make incredible difference. So I'll I'll follow the microphones here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you talked about a hundred billion in new investment going into gas power plants. Can you talk about or maybe elaborate on the efforts to get those utilities to, to rethink? Yeah. So yeah, thank you for the question. It's a good one. I think that, um, so this is economics, right? We can say today it's cheaper to build the clean energy portfolio than the gas plant. That doesn't mean yet uniformly that it's in the interest of the utility to do that. In many cases, they'll earn a better rate of return if they build the gas plant. So we're at this kind of perilous moment where regulators have to step up to make sure that, and this is not like, no, buy the more expensive thing because it's better for the planet. This is buy the cheaper thing because it's better for the planet and for ratepayers. But there's still a ton of regulatory work that needs to be done state by state to push on public utility regulators. We've got great ones in this state that are looking very closely at these issues. And Excel has, in fact, been really progressive in, looking, in seizing the opportunity to replace, you know, uh, coal with, with, with solar and wind. But um, the fact that we've crossed the, the economic threshold doesn't mean we're over the hump to ensure the outcome. So yeah, thanks for the question. Hi. Um, so my apologies, the IPCC report that was issued last year, I only read a summary. I did not read the entire report. And I know they mentioned carbon pricing. Can you go into any more detail about what they said in the report about carbon pricing? Um, and I can't really speak to that in detail. I mean, I can say that, um, you know, when we look at, uh, at the energy system as an integrated system, the, the great virtue of carbon pricing is that it creates opportunities and drive across the whole of the energy system to find the cheapest solutions as opposed to pushing on the utility sector here and pushing on uh, car efficiency standards there and sort of trying to find the solution piece by piece. So, uh, I mean, my view is that we'll take whatever we can get on, on all those horizons, uh, that uh, carbon pricing is, an, as an economist, uh, you know, recognize its, its power and uh, effectiveness. And uh, you know, wherever in the world we can see those types of measures, I think we'll see solutions go faster. And the good thing about that is that we'll see solutions that are chosen by finding the cheapest solutions to deliver 
carbon emission reductions. Take one towards the back. <coughs> Thanks so much, uh, Jim. Great, great presentation, as always. Um, and my question was really uh, similar to the one around the gap between the economics and the reality, and you really pinpointed it with the regulatory, because we don't get to go to the grocery store and choose the cleaner, cheaper thing, right? So right. I just respectfully want to say that there's also a gap here in Colorado, I think it exists in a lot of other states, between kind of what's being said and what's being done our electricity is still 73% fossil fuel. Excel is spending over a half billion dollars a year on their fossil plants. They're spending tens of millions fixing them up and they're hoping to earn 7%. So I just really wanted to underscore that, ask for your thoughts about how to do it. And if anybody is here from Colorado, we'll be doing a training on October 21st at the Meadows Library to help you understand how to, to do that. So it's really that, how do we close it? There is that gap, now how do we close it? Yeah. And it's what it. Uh, Could you just take it off the this one right there and just hold it closer to your mouth for me? This this yeah. one, is that better? Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So, yeah, it's a great point. Uh, there, there's a, a lot of work to be done, basically to take advantage of the economics, if you will, and part of that is going to entail uh, a faster retirement of existing coal and even natural gas plants. So uh, that's something that, uh, that incumbent companies are resistant to do. There's actually opportunities to do that more effectively. We're working on some of this through what's called securitization. That is, we take an asset off the utility's books so that the utility, rather than earning 8% rate of return on it, as they would do normally, you securitize it, take it off their books. They, they pay off the debt of that asset at 3%. And, uh, and the net benefit of replacing that with wind and solar is large enough to pay for that transition and also to leave some money on the table to pay for just transition, for uh, helping the, the communities and workers that are affected by those plants being shut down. In my view, it's really important that we take consideration of just transition as we kind of engineer these pathways because there are communities and workers that are affected uh, they do push back, and there's enough net benefit, if we engineer it right, to help to smooth that transition. And it's in everybody's interest that we, that we make that happen faster and better. So thank you for the comment. There's a, there's a, a lot of work still to be done, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're seeing, as you say, incremental progress in the right direction, and not as much progress fast enough uh, to get us to our 1.5 degree goals. Maybe we'll take the one back in the corner there. We're at five minutes. Okay. Thank you. If you could back up to your slide, this is another economics question, and I'm Ed Lieber from South Bend for CCL. Uh, the, the question I had is about the, the gas plants that you had back in your slide and the uh, relative cost of maintaining, building and maintaining the gas plants relative to an integrated uh, clean energy solution. And I was wondering, is, as you looked at those various gas plants, whether you were considering the cost of them, the marginal cost that is the cost of the individual plant, or what the overall system cost would be as you eliminated or try, try to eliminate all of them. Yeah, we're, we're looking at them individually we're looking at replacing, you know, this is where the utilities would push back and they would say, well, solar and wind isn't the same as gas. We're looking at replacing uh, exactly the performance attributes that the gas plant could deliver. So can we ramp the energy supply from wind, solar, batteries, and demand response at the same rate that we could the gas plant? Can we deliver the same maximum energy, the maximum uh, load, and can we deliver the total energy? So we're trying to look at it from, a, from an integrated perspective of all those attributes. And then as we accumulate more of that transition, we'll have to look at the integration of the whole system to make sure that it operates well. So uh, we're definitely looking at all of those dimensions to make sure that, this, you know, that the 
solutions are workable and realistic. The other thing I'd underscore as we think about natural gas is that uh, just bear in mind how much we've learned in the last two years about natural gas leakage because, uh, it, you know, I, I, I worked a lot on natural gas earlier in my career as we did tend to think of it more as a bridge fuel, but the science around rates of natural gas leakage and its co climate consequence really underscore that the transition from coal to gas is not nearly as favorable as we thought, uh, given the potency of, of methane in the environment. So these are workable solutions. We know how to make it happen. We're seeing it happen pretty fast around the world. And uh, certainly, I th from my perspective, the uh, transition in electricity system to literally 100% renewables uh, is a feasible and manageable transition. That's the, one of the technical parts of the transition that I worry the very least about. Do, is, one more question? Yeah. Uh, we have someone who's Hi. You didn't mention nuclear energy in your presentation. I was wondering if you could um, talk about how much that has in terms of its potential for um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then the second part of my question is, um, when Paul Hawkins also talks about the potential of all these non-energy um, system kinds of changes, like um, reducing food waste, uh, forestry, um, family planning, um, and yeah. can you comment on how you see those fitting into the pathway? Yeah, thank you. So uh, nuclear uh, is an expensive solution today. If you look at the nuclear power plants that have been built in the last decade, there's nowhere where they have not been built without a combination of subsidy and sort of, in this country, ratepayer guarantee that the very substantial cost overruns they have incurred will be paid back by customers. Uh, so. There are uh, optimists about s small nuclear reactor technologies delivering us a breakthrough. Our work at RMI doesn't give us a lot of confidence relative to alternatives that we can see delivering today that those are really going to play. Because we can do it with solar and wind and storage and, and changes on the demand side we, with a set of technologies that we know very well and that we're seeing at scale. So that's our opinion, is that nuclear is, is not a necessary part of the solution and not likely an economic part of the solution. I've talked about energy, but uh, you're absolutely right uh, that if, when we think about climate, it's a much bigger frame. And food waste is incredibly important. Uh, reforestation and land use uh, offers in, you know, an, a, a portfolio of solutions by which we can help to offset some of the challenges of climate. And I think as certainly as citizens and policymakers, we for sure need to have that wider view of, of uh, a, a big range of solutions. So thank you. Yeah, thank you all very much. <laughs>